All right, let's talk about sets and subsets. This is one of the basic building blocks of math, and it's very key to understanding how we start to organize things in a logical fashion. So talking about sets is all about organizing, organizing stuff. When you start talking about sets in mathematics, you want to be very cautious. Uh, you'll find every mathematician who talks to you about sets is very cagey and guarded, almost like a lawyer, because a set is the basic building block of everything we understand in math, and that means we have to define it properly. In the last section, we talked about deductive reasoning, going from the general to the specific. Well, the most general thing you can do in math is talk about a set. So we have to be very, very specific about what a set is and what we think it can do. We have to be very sure that we're correct and true because then we can use deduction on everything else to start with a set and build up everything else. So, a set is a collection of objects. Notice it's very much of a weasel word here, objects. Who knows what that is? It's just stuff. It's a collection of stuff. And this stuff can be very clearly described, and that's another key thing. It has to be clearly described. In math, we don't say clearly described. We say well-defined. So a set has to be a collection. It's like a box. It's a box that holds stuff. And this stuff has to be very clearly defined. These objects, we come up with a name for them. We call them elements. Sometimes they might be called members of the set, but generally I think I use the word elements. So I put elements into my set. The elements are my stuff, and my set is my box. Let's talk about some things with my set box. It is a box that holds stuff. It holds as much as I like, but it only holds one copy. Not just one copy, only one copy of each element. So if I had my box and I was putting cats into my box, well, I would only put one cat in it, and that cat would be standing in for all cats. If I'm putting something else into my box, I only have to put in one copy of that thing, of one copy of each element, and I can take that element out and use it as often as I like. My set box doesn't have order. It has no order. I can rearrange things any way I want. I might rearrange them alphabetically. I might throw them in randomly. My box has no order. Something else, I can put as many boxes inside my box as I need. I can pack it with more boxes. And then let's talk about my elements of stuff. My elements need to be specific things. You should be able to describe them. Um, anything that you can describe, though, can be an element. Um, but it needs to be one specific thing. If we're going to describe a collection of things, well, we'd be back to describing another set. So I would not say that, um, uh, I, I don't think a, a specific thing would usually not be maybe the Dodgers, because that's a team. Instead, I would talk about the members of the Dodgers, and I would pack them in their own specific box. So the elements are specific. So now that I've said that the, a set is a box, it holds these elements, and it has to be well-defined, which means I have a very, very clear idea of what goes into a particular box, let's talk about how I describe a box. There's three different methods we use to describe things that are sets. We use these three different methods, and, well, and initially in the text, in, in this book, in this class, I'm going to use all three to describe stuff. In real life, one of these methods is going to be the clear winner, usually, and the others are going to be wicked hard to do. So word descriptions for a set. This describes something very clearly. In words, sometimes this is fast, sometimes it's not. I'm teaching here at Victoria College, so a word description could be the math teachers, the math professors, at Victoria College. Um, remember that a set is a collection of objects. These objects have to be clearly described and they have to be well-defined. 
So let me go back and look and see. The math professors at Victoria College. That's still a little bit of an iffy statement because sometimes people retire and sometimes we hire new people on. So this isn't actually a well-defined set yet. You could get away with several different things. So let me be a little more blunt. The math professors at Victoria College as of spring, let's do summer this winter. Have to be very specific with this. So the math professors at Victoria College as of spring 2011. That's very, very specific. So in this semester, spring 2011, I'm talking about the math professors. That's specific enough. Roster method, just like a team roster, it's a list of people. In roster method, I list things out explicitly. We use these little curly brackets for sets. I can't draw them very well by hand, but you'll see them in your book. They look pretty much like this. In the roster method, I list each thing out specifically. So I've got Wiley, and I put a comma. And I have Yasko, I put a comma. I've got Yang, Dr. Yang, and put a comma. And then I have Poggle, and I put a comma. And then I've got White. And these right now are the, the people in the math department as of spring 2011, so I put a closing brackets right there. You know, normally I'd write this all out in one line, but so I could have my three columns all visible on the screen. I would put them in columns and whatnot, so I put them out. Each of these is an element in my set. Notice there's no particular order going on. And I separated each element by a comma. And this roster method very clearly lists out exactly who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the math professors at Victoria College in spring 2011, because that's the people who we've got on our list. Set builder notation is probably the least good one to use for this particular collection of objects, elements. But set builder notation would look like this. I'd give my set a name. Maybe I won't call it A, because we're going to use A all over your book. I'll call it capital M for math professors. Okay? And I put an equal sign. Then I put my opening uh, brace. And then I would say this. I would say X. X is our math letter that stands in. It's a variable. It represents anything. Then I put this vertical line here. It means such that. So I'm talking about some different objects. X, they're going to change. And now I'm going to describe after the such that uh, very particularly what I mean. X is an element of the spring... 2011 DC math professors. And then I'll put my closing bracket. So this is three different ways of describing a set. Notice that my set is very specific. Maybe in this particular set, roster method is nice. There's not all that many of us, so we can get a nice short list here. It's very specific. But maybe if you just look at this list, you'd be like feeling like one of those Saturday Night Live sketches where they give you the answer to the question and ask what the question is. It's like, Wiley, Yasko, Yang, Pago, White, what are they? Mm -hmm, I don't know. So maybe this word description gets things pretty well um, described what's going on. Set builder notation, again, is very nice. Set builder notation is usually best used when there's some sort of obvious pattern you're following. So you're talking about certain numbers, maybe all the numbers that have been multiplied by two. Um, you can very easily fit some sort of thing into this last part here that describes it, that describes a nice mathematical pattern quite well. Roster method is good for short lists. Shorter lists are best. And you use word descriptions for things that are very specific, but maybe are hard to get at with some sort of pattern, like in, in set builder notation, and are probably too long for roster method. So maybe a good word description of a set would be the collection of all uh, religious leaders in the world of religions that had more than 100,000 people at at least some point in their existence. That would be very, very specific. 
but that would be rather hard to put into set builder notation. And the list of people who meet that is way too many people for me to want to list them all out in the roster method. So once I have this idea of what a set is, you can convert between these different methods and you'll have some exercises that run you through that. But as soon as I've told you that a set is a box, then your first question should be, well, what about an empty box? And that's called an empty set. We can either draw it out kind of explicitly like this. It's just like my roster or my uh, uh, set builder notation here, but I haven't put anything in it. On the other hand, we get a little tired of doing that, so we tend to do this zero with a slash through it. I think sometimes in more uh, modern high school classes, people use this for something that means does not exist. And we're not quite using that definition here. This right here means an empty set. Um, your book is very careful to make a very nice big round circle and have a little slash through it. We're not using zero. Zero is not the empty set, and that's maybe the one thing you want to be cautious. This is a symbol for an empty set. This right here is not an empty set. It's a very particular set. It's the set that contains the element zero. So just because zero is a number that means nothing, this is not a, a zeroed out set. This is a set that has something. What does it have? Well, it has the element and that number zero in there. So that's a very particular thing. And this set right here is also kind of a weird one. It's a set that contains an empty set. It's a box with another empty box inside of it. And that's not the same thing as an empty box, as we all know. If you have an empty box, if you've got a box that has another empty box inside of it, that's different than a box that's just all empty by himself. So we have empty set. Sometimes this is called the null set. Null just means uh, nothing in it. It's also sometimes called the not set, um, if you're British. After I've talked to you about sets that are empty, let's talk about sets that have stuff in them. Not full sets, but full earth sets. Uh, that's a bit of a joke there. You can pack as much as you like in a set box as long as you've described it properly. Once I've talked about something living in a set, we usually start to think about this. So I'm going to talk about the set with the letters A, B, C, and D in there. This can stand in for anything, but right now let's just talk about the set that has these first letters in it. Well, if I want to specifically tell you that the letter A is inside this set, I might talk about A here. A is an element. And I put this little symbol. It's almost like a sort of a capital E, but it's not. It's a little more swoopy. And if I write this, what this means is that the element A is an element of the set. So this right here means is an element of. And of course, since I've written this set out in uh, roster notation, I can just look in here and see that A is something in this set. But if I'd written the set out maybe in as a word description up here, I could have said something like Wiley is an element of this set. And then even though I've described it as a word, you know that I happen to be a, a VC math professor as of spring 2011. I could also successfully use that under the set builder description of it. Okay, so this means is an element of. As soon as I've said that A is an element of this set, we might wonder something else. The letter, um, I don't know what the letter is, um, E. E is not an element of the set A, B, C, D. Again, each element has its own place here, separated by commas. This is a set, but E's not one of these four things inside of this set, so I say he's not an element. Just like I use the slash here to say this is not a set that has anything in it. It's an empty set. A slash through something in math means not. So I've got this idea of that things are elements and are not elements in here. So now, having said all this stuff, let's talk about some specific things. I can count the number of things inside a set. Count the number of elements in a set. And when I count the number of elements in a set, um, usually, again, I use a capital letter to name a set. So let's go back here. 
I've used the letter capital M to denote this set that contains the VC math faculty as of spring 2011. And the way I count the number of elements in a set is I use a lowercase n, parentheses, and I put the capital M inside here. This capital M is my name for my set of all VC math faculty in 2011. This right here means I'm going to count them up. We call this the cardinality of the set. Cardinality of the set. That's your word there, cardinality. And it counts how many things are in here. I would say that this process, what I'm doing is I'm putting the, the, the set M inside this, this number counter. And what it does is it runs through and counts them all up. So let's go up here and count them. I've got one, two, three, four, five. I've got five people in there. So I'd say the cardinality of the set of VC math faculty in spring 2011 was five. This right here also shows, I think, one of the first things you want to get in good habit of in math. Be very careful between lowercase and uppercase. Maybe about 15% of students I see, they like to change things. They only use capital letters or they only use lowercase letters. And you want to be super, super careful to use lowercase letters where we use lowercase letters in the book and use uppercase letters where we use uppercase letters because we make a distinction. Capital letters stand for names of things, for example, names of a set. This lowercase n means I'm counting up stuff inside of my set. An uppercase n would mean something else. In fact, an uppercase n is the number of, um, is the set name actually for the natural numbers, the ones you use to count one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So you don't want to be mixing up your lowercase and your capital letters because that will lead you to, to pain and suffering later on. Once I've decided that I can count a set and find out its cardinality, this lets me talk about what it means to be an equivalent set. So we have the words equivalent. We also have the words equal. In real life, I don't know that we make a distinction between these two words all that much. But in sets, we do. Equivalent just means it has the same number. We'll say the same cardinality. So if I say that set A is equivalent to set B, what I'm really saying is the number of things in set A is the same as the number of things in set B. So here's an example. If I make set A be the same thing as letters A, B, C, D, and now E in it, well, the number of things in A is 5. Remember, the number of things in my set of VC math faculty in 2011 was also 5. That means that set A and set M are, are equivalent. They're not equal because I'm not the letter A and the rest of my colleagues aren't the letters B, C, D, and E. So they're not equal, but they are equivalent because it's the same number of things. Both the set A and the set M are boxes and each of these boxes hold the same number of things. It's five. So that makes them equivalent. And as soon as I've said equivalent, then we start talking about this last idea of section 2.1, which is one-to-one. -one. You can write it like that. You can say one-to-one. -one. Or we even have this math word. I don't know if it's in your book. It's called injective. So I've got one-to-one. -one. Injective, these mean the same things. The idea of one-to-one -one means that for each thing in the first part, there's something in the second part that matches up to him. So for A, B, C, D, and E, even though these aren't equal to this other set of Wiley, Yasko, Yang, Poggle, and White, I can create this one-to-one -one equivalence. I can connect these guys, I can connect these guys, I can connect these two, these two, and finally E and Y. I can create this relationship and connection there. Maybe I can do it a little nicer with arrows. Basically I'm creating a, a connector between each of these 
And for all of set A, I've got a place where each of these letters in set A could go in my other set here. And for set M, I've got a place where each of the things in set M can go. And this would be called a one-to-one -one relationship. So if they have this injective or one-to-one -one relationship between two sets, then you know their cardinalities are the same. And I would say that these two sets were equivalent. I would say two sets are equal if they have exactly the same elements with exactly the same number. So equal doesn't mean equivalent. This means I need to have both sets. Both are exactly the same, right down to the last thing. So when I'm talking, usually you talk about equal if I'm describing two things with some different words. So I could say the math professors at Victoria College as of spring 2011. I might also talk about the math professors at Victoria College as of summer 2011. That would look like a different set. And yet, we actually are the same group in spring and summer this year in 2011. And so then I might say, OK, those two sets are equal. They're not just the same, but the people in spring 2011 versus the people in the math department in summer 2011, these actually happen to be equal sets. And I could then put the equal sign in between them. Same number of people, and in fact, it is the exact same people. What I've been giving you so far is an example of something called a finite set. The word finite just means it has an ending. It has an ending. It also means it's very specific. Now remember, all sets have to be very specific. They have to be well-defined. But just because something's well-defined doesn't mean it has an end. And my perfect example of this is this set that I called capital N up here, which I said was the natural numbers. We call them the natural numbers because these are the ones everyone uses naturally. Everyone can count. Finite sets have an ending, but the natural numbers don't have an ending. Natural numbers never end. And this is true because no matter how big of a natural number you tell me, I can always add one to it and get something bigger. Let's say you're, you're clever. You're right, OK, 9,000, I don't know. You put a whole bunch of nines with a whole bunch of commas in there. Well, I can always add one to it, move over to the next column space, and come up with something bigger. I don't know, ten, hundreds. Thousands, millions, billions, so this is one trillion. You came up with a very large number, 999 billion. It was very big, but I came up with something called a trillion. In fact, I can always just tack on more zeros at the end of everything, and suddenly I have um, whatever the next one after a trillion is. So the natural numbers never end. When I write the set of natural numbers, I wrote it like that. I wrote 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and finally I put this dot, dot, dot. That dot, dot, dot means carry on like we're obviously supposed to be carrying on. It's called an ellipsis. Not an ellipse, an ellipsis. Um, and these dots just mean keep on going in that way. When a set is like this, I say that the cardinality of set n, I can't give you a particular number, so I say its cardinality is not finite, it's infinite. The prefix in means not, usually. You know, inflammable is probably a pretty bad thing. Um, incompetent means you're not competent. Infinite means you're not finite, you don't have an ending here. So we talk about this word infinity. So I've talked about boxes. I've talked about the fact that if I have a set A, B, C, D, and E, the letter A is an element of that set, and the letter E is not an element of that set. So now let's go back and talk about our lovely set of mathematicians here, Wiley, Yasko, Yang, Poggle, and White. Well, I could say definitely that Wiley 
is an element of that. And I could also say that Dr. Bell, who teaches biology here at VC, is not an element of the math people. She teaches biology because she has another L in her name. But I could also do something else. If I'm looking at this group of people, I notice something about these two. These two right here have last names that start with Y. I might want to talk about the math people at VC whose last names start with Y. So I would focus in on them and talk about Yasko and Yang. But Yasko and Yang should have some sort of relationship to the overall group of all math people. And again, I don't want to keep on writing Wiley, Yasko, Yang, Poggle, and White, and that's why we came up with a name for it. We called it capital M. These two right here are individually elements of the whole thing, no doubt. But this is a new box. It's a new box that has Yasko and Yang in it. And so that means I can't talk about it as an element. Instead, I write this. And this right here is the symbol for subset. In fact, I've got two symbols for subsets, maybe even three. I've got this one that I've just done, and I've got this one. This one right here looks just like this, but it doesn't have this little equals bar down here. This one right here is a symbol for a proper subset. Proper subsets, just like people who know how to drink tea and stuff sit nicely at tables, they're very nice and well-behaved. And what I mean by a proper subset is that this group right here is officially smaller in terms of cardinality than this part. Since I said it's a subset, that means that definitely all this stuff in here is each of them individually elements of the bigger set, and I didn't grab everything out of the bigger set. If I just use this symbol for a subset, I might have given myself a subset that was just as big as the original set. An example of this might be, what if I talk about my set of people who's the VC math faculty, and remember we said this was for spring 2011. I might talk about the people who are going to be the VC math faculty for the entire year of 2011. And so you might imagine that for the entire year of 2011, we've got Wiley, Yasko, Yang, Poggle, and White. But let's say we hire somebody new in the fall. We'll call him newbie. We hire this newbie in the fall. And so then the people who were the math faculty in spring are definitely part of this new bigger group who's the math faculty at VC for the entire year 2011. But they're still not quite equal. And so we would just use this little subset thing. But let's say we don't actually hire a newbie in the fall. I still have the idea that this set over here on the right side is, is bigger. It's for the whole year 2011. And yet, the actual fact is that the people in spring and the people for the whole year of 2011 were, in fact, exactly the same people. And so because of that, I would talk about this as being a uh, subset still. This is a subset of this one. And yet, I really like to have this equal set here because it means the chance is there that the two ones are equal. Just like an element I can have is an element of and is not an element of, well, I can have that for a subset too. A, B, C, D is not a subset of the VC math faculty in 2011. Apparently I can't do the letter M. These things have nothing to do with this. I can go further. Wiley and Matt, which is the set that contains my name, is not a subset of the VC math faculty. Why? Because I was very careful when I described the VC math faculty. It was all of our last names. Here, I've got a set that contains all my names. Yes, I happen to be a member of the VC math faculty, but I've only really described myself as being that in terms of Wiley. This Matt right here is separated from Wiley. 
We could get into some kind of interesting argument, probably, about the question whether the, the box that only has the element Matt Wiley, which is just a very specific description of me as a subset of here. But that's really beyond the scope of this particular course. There's a whole class called set theory. If any of the set theory stuff seems interesting to you, and it can take an entire semester. So we're just talking about some basic stuff here. This guy right here is not a subset of the VC math department because it's all my names, and it's got all my names off in a list. And that's different than thinking of my names as one complete connected thing that makes me part of the math faculty. One last thing to, to point out in terms of subsets. There's two sort of special cases and special observations we can make. One, the empty set is always going to be a subset. This is just a, a definition sort of thing that we use to make things make sense. The empty set is a subset of the entire set. Why? Because there's always an empty space where you could put somebody else in, is the way I like to think about it. We could hire a newbie in the fall. We haven't yet. We don't know if we will, but we could. Since there's always that possibility, the empty set is always there. It just basically means a set can have as many things in it as you need it to have. It's always got some empty space going on. So the empty set's always a subset of everything. And also, since every set is in fact a, 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 connect, a collection of its own things, we also say this, which is kind of weird. It's not a proper subset. But every set is also a subset of itself. Not a proper subset, but it is a subset. Because of that, we've got the ability to count how many subsets something has. We get two possibilities. We've got the proper subsets, and we've got just subsets. The empty set is a proper subset of the bigger set. No doubt about that. It's smaller. The empty set has cardinality. The empty set is, of course, 0. The cardinality of this guy, we said, was 5. That definitely makes him a proper subset. However, here, the cardinality of both of these, of course, is 5, because they're exactly the same thing. That means they're just subsets of each other. It's not a proper subset. And here's our trick. Once you've counted up the number of things, inside of a set. You're going to have two raised to that exponent number of things as the possible subsets you can cook up. So let's count out 2 to the fifth. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 times 2 is 32. I'm not going to list out all 32 proper subsets and subsets of the math faculty, but let's look at some of them. I could have a set that just has me. I could have a set that just has Yang. I could have a set that just has Yasko. And I could have a set that just has uh, Poggle. I could have a set that just has White. This would be one collection. I could also have the one that has Wiley. Can't even spell my name. It has, I really want to put white in that set. I could have the one that has Wiley and has Yasko. That's a subset. Notice this is the same subset as Yasko, Wiley. Remember, there's no order, so I wouldn't relist Yasko, Wiley as another one. That wouldn't work. I can have the one that has Wiley and Yang. Again, Yang and Wiley would not be a different one, so I'm not going to list that. I'm going to have several more pairings of these because we haven't yet done Yasko and Yang. As you can see, if I start playing around with this, I get a lot. To get the full 32, after you play this all, this, you get the single ones, you get the doubles, you're going to also have the triples, an example of which might be Wiley, Yang, and Yasko. You're also going to have the quadruples, where we have Wiley, Yang, Yasko, and White, let's say. 
and all the different variations of that. But you're going to have the two special ones of, remember, the empty set, and you're also going to have the original full set as well. So these two would be tacked on as well. If you do it all right, you're going to get 32. If you're having trouble get 30, getting 32, you should send me an email. The proper subsets, it's going to be 2 to the n. Here it's 2 to the fifth. 2 to the fifth minus 1, because I get rid of this guy. So you've got some examples in your textbook that talk about finding subsets and finding proper subsets and counting out how many of those there will be. These abilities to count are nice because they let you know how many you think you should be looking for. Once you know how many subsets there are, you can figure out how many different ways you might combine a group to make, create subgroups. So if you have a group in the Senate and you want to know how many different committees you could cook up, well, subsets would be a way that you'd talk about it. We don't always have five things in our set, so in your book you'll see they use 2 to the n and 2 to the n minus 1. N just is standing for the number of things, and that N comes entirely from this little N here, which is talking about the cardinality. You put the cardinality in there. And that gets us through sets and subsets. So now you're ready to look at some of the homework that deals with that.